Welcome, everyone. This is uh, episode four of the second season of the Prince and Makers Book Club. We have a very special guest tonight, Tyler Green. And our setup for the evening, as we, as we do with each night, um, is kind of a theme that we select that seems appropriate relative to the guest and maybe some of the, of the times that we live in as well. And, and tonight, you know, and going through uh, Tyler Green's new book, Emerson, Emerson's Nature, and the artists, where we're diving into this uh, deeply tonight and going over a lot of information. I thought it would be important to just kind of touch on this concept of visual language as we understand it, because we'll be really diving into what visual language in the 19th century uh, was all about and what it meant um, to the American idea and American experiment. You know, many of us are familiar with uh, like either Northern Renaissance or Italian Renaissance artworks that were laden with symbolism and they were read in a different way by people of their time period. And this Jan van Eyck uh, painting is one of those classic examples where it, it shows you know, the couple that in their time, all of the objects that are present in this room were exceptionally important and told a great deal. You have the, um, the convex mirror, you've got the orange on the mantle, um, the, the, the way that they are holding their hands, the fact that there's the dog and the shoes, all of these things were telling a narrative um, story about the lives and the power and influence of these individuals to anyone who would see this painting. And not to mention the fact that they were able to afford to have it painted in the first place. So these images represented a great deal to the community of people that would get to experience it at that time, you know, their contemporaries. And as we, you know, think about reading works of art or understanding the language, the Italian Renaissance, you know, was full of, uh, different types of symbolism for the nature of power as well as um, spreading influence. And in cases of a lot of Renaissance works that, you know, the, the big thing I state with uh, reading these is looking for the patron. So this here is the portrait of, um, of Jacopo. And he has himself here, you know, lowered relative to the Pope and the Pope lowered relative to the saint. And this sort of information that we're getting here in this painting is not just to glorify, you know, glorify Rome, or right? it's also to glorify himself. He's got, he was the commander of the Venetian naval um, forces, uh, won a major victory against the Turks, and here are his ships in the background, and also the symbols of the Pope and of the Catholic Church of the Keys of Heaven here present at the bottom. So from our eyes today, we don't necessarily have the visual vernacular, that visual language to read this as easily as people in their time. And as you get further separated from that time, you have to rely more and more and more on written documents or accounts of the works in their time to try to understand or to read this visual language. Otherwise, we only have the lens that we have to apply to it today. You know, Durer's St. Jerome in his study is a classic example of how an artist packs an image with all kinds of symbolism for their time. And, you know, being that this, this print was made three years before the 95 Theses, in the beginning of the full-on beginning of the Reformation, what we have is a saint from the fourth century in a Durer's 16th century contemporary study, right? So this is not a fourth century study. It's a contemporary study. And you have the saint who had translated the early versions of the Bible, who is here in this scholarly way and at his scholarly work. But what Durer is also showing us here is the skull reminding of people of their mortality, the cross reminding people of their possibility of redemption. You have the hourglass, which is another reminder of the, of the limited amount of time that you have to perform the works, as well as you know, the telltale halo for the saint. So just in case we didn't know, this guy's the saint, that's Saint Jerome. And so when you start thinking about the influence that a work can have within its time period, Durer making this image of, Saint Jerome and the work that he was tasked with, this translation of the Bible. And you put that into context of the, you know, the very beginning stages of the Reformation. There's a lot of power in the symbolism that is that can be read into this work. Um, and from our eyes looking back, it doesn't have the same weight as it would to the eyes of those that were looking at it in Durer's time. Another great image to point to, especially kind of leading up into the conversation that we're having is, is David's The Death of Socrates. It is known that uh, Thomas Jefferson saw this work in Paris and was 
um, very well moved by it. It was something that he greatly loved and he actually wrote about seeing. This painting was, you know, after the American Revolution, ahead of the French, Revo the French Revolution, was seen as the, the defiance against the dominant power structure. So it became a symbol, this, this Socrates willingness to die for the cause became a symbol of revolution or to overthrow the trappings of, you know, an unrelenting aristocrat and to really pursue one's own destiny and to take control of that. So as a work, you know, the symbolism here, even though it's a classical theme, it was really used in its day to talk about issues of their time and to inspire a specific attitude or way of moving in the world. And when we start thinking about how that jumps into more contemporary times, um, Aaron Douglas, major artist of the Harlem Renaissance, was using similar, similar ways of symbolism in order to start to redefine the African-American experience, to create the concept of the African-American experience through visualization, through the Harlem Renaissance, as there's this massive migration of peoples from the South to the North, where you're getting a larger mixing of the African diaspora in the United States and a, and a pushing towards um, identity that is a decidedly African-American identity separate from white American identity. And so when you, when you really take that into context, a work like this in its day had a, had a much higher level of impact for the African-American community than say a portrait by John Snyder Sargent. And if we fast forward that to how we're still using this form of visual language, this symbolism today, for me, I get like the thing that comes first to mind are the portraits of Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, the official portraits. And if you go to the National Portrait Gallery's website, there's a long list detailing all of the symbolism of each of that's at present in each mm -hmm. of these paintings, right? So it's they're giving you the crib sheet to read the painting not just to experience the work for the visual that it is. You know, it goes into the details for, especially for the uh, portrait of Barack Obama, um, which flowers were used and what they referenced. So, you know, the flowers reference um, his uh, time in Kansas, the flowers to ref the jasmine flowers for Hawaii, a flower for his father in Kenya, uh, everything down to the suit, the posture, it's all detailed out of what this is intended by the artist to visually read and convey. And similarly for Michelle Obama, the designer of her clothes, the reason the hair was styled that the way that she was, why she's positioned the way that she is, all of this stuff has gone into. And so there is this record of what the artist intended us to get from this. So it's this idea that the visual language or the reading of a painting or a two-dimensional visual work of art is something that we used to do, I, th I think is, is an antiquated notion. It's the artists, no matter what they're making, are creating a visual language for us to read. And the more versed we are within that artist's work and within the work of this time or the time period of that artist, the easier it is for us to read those works. And so when, I, you know, when Tyler and I first started talking about um, doing a conversation about his new book, Emerson's Nature and the Artist, what I was really interested in was how he was learning to read these works in mm -hmm. the vernacular of their time. And so to introduce Tyler Green, he's the host, of, host and founder of the Modern Arts Notes podcast. So if you haven't checked into that podcast, it's founded in 2011. It's great. Um, you've done hundreds of episodes dealing with contemporary artists across the spectrum. And it, as well as curators and, and um, conservators. It's a, it's a really rich way to spend your day if you wanna spend your day involved in art. It's a great podcast break from all the news ones that will upset you and make your blood <laughs> boil. This is one of those things that helps inspire you a bit. Um, but Tyler's previous book, uh, Carlton Watkins, uh, Making the West American is also a great read. And we'll touch probably on that from time to time tonight uh, throughout the program. But um, tonight we really will be focusing on Emerson's Nature and the Artist. It's just out. I was lucky enough to get a copy and go through it for our conversation this evening. And without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Tyler and prompt him with an initial question because one of the things that struck me the most right there in the beginning of the book was this concept of the definition of the word landscape and how it was really new to the American vernacular 
and the 1830s and 1840s. And if, if you could help uh, yeah. everyone else get up to speed with that, because it was something that I was completely unaware of and it really set the stage. Hi, Phil. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, I am not sure why my camera is making me look um, as red faced um, as I am. It's I'm, I'm not getting any more sun than anybody else's in late October. Um, even though I have been out in the landscape, as we now use the word, which which to Phil's point, um, you know, in uh, in the early 19th century, um, the word landscape comes into British English, English English, um, and it comes in from the Dutch, um, and the Dutch word is landschap, L-A-N-D-S-C-H-A-A-P. And in the Dutch, I love this, in the Dutch, it means a painting of the land. Um, it is a word that comes into use specifically to refer to paintings. You know, what's the stat? What's the great stat the art historians of, of, of the Netherlands love that the average Dutch family had something like 13 paintings in their house? Um, so, so, so to use a word to refer to painted land was like almost necessary, right? And so that word is landscap. Um, and the word comes into British English in the late 18th century. Um, and you can, in, in, in the etymology of the word, you can see the British kind of figuring out how to use it. Um, and the word doesn't really come into the United States until the 1820s. And um, uh, the example I use in the book is the, the novels of James Fenimore Cooper. Um, and in James Fenimore Cooper's famous, what is it, 1823, 1826, something like that, um, O Susquehanna, the Pioneers, um, Cooper uses the word twice. And one usage we can understand as the way we use landscape now, yonder. Um, but the other usage Cooper uses is totally obscure to us. Like we recognize the word, but we don't understand what the heck he's talking about. It's a it's a word that in the in the 1820s, as we get toward Emerson in 1836, its meaning is in flux. Its meaning is not determined. Um, so in, 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 as Emerson becomes interested in nature, kind of a classic capital R romantic interest, um, he's trying to come up with a way, he understands that nature is a really abstract thing. Um, go enjoy nature, he says. Well, what the heck does that mean? Nature is everywhere, sort of. Um, and so Emerson understands he needs to give Americans a frame within which to understand and appreciate this nature into which he's sending them. Um, and so because Emerson at this early stage in his career is still learning how to be a philosopher and intellectual, he realizes he has to under he has to define his terms. Philosophers love to do this, and much of the European work Emerson has read by this point, he's read philosophers define their terms, and early on in their work. So, in the third paragraph of Nature's first chapter, Emerson defines landscape, and he dis defines it as if he's standing on a hill across the road from his home in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, he defines landscape as this charming landscape before me. Um, and he defines it as everything he sees from this hill across from his house. So there are farmer's fields, there are woodlots, the, um, the copses of trees from which people will cut down their firewood each year. Um, and, 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 and he defines landscape as the entire view shed uh, that he sees before him. And all the more um, interesting, especially I think to us now, is Emerson defines landscape as a specifically anti-capitalist concept. He says that the entirety of the view shed, which is made up of Jones's property and Smith's property and Frank's property, the most important part of the landscape is the view shed um, in which no individual one of those people holds title. Um, he says the landscape is the entirety of it and we should value it for the entirety of it. So Emerson's doing like six things at once here, which is classic for nature. He, he does six things at once all the time, um, which is why it's such a chewy, dense read, which I hope this book kind of unpacks a little. 
Um, he, he, he wants to separate capitalism from republicanism, America's Republican experiment a bit. He wants to define the place in which people may enjoy nature. Um, and he wants to also point Americans to an, a, a new place where Americans might define the, the, their new nation culturally. Um, something that is all American that is not borrowed from or descended from Europe. Um, and so he proposes this interstitial space, he calls landscape and it's interstitial because it's between the city over here and it's between wilderness over here. Landscape is what Americans after the British have carved out between coastal urbanity and wilderness. Um, and I think, you know, our, our, the meaning of the word landscape has changed in 185 years since Emerson wrote nature, certainly. Um, but I think that for the purpose of understanding both Emerson's text and 19th century American painting and photography, a little bit later, um, we have to address landscape as Emerson addressed landscape. And to your point with that, I mean, I, I think it's important for everyone to know just how widely published and read Emerson's nature was within his time. I mean, it's one of the most published works in the 19th century. It is the most, it is, it is certainly the most influential nonfiction essay between Thomas Paine and the Civil War and probably the most influential nonfiction work of the 19th century. Um, and so not only is it reproduced in something like, I mean, I figured out to the best of my ability, the number of editions of something like 105. And then each, each one of those editions, of course, could run through multiple printings. And then of course, Emerson on top of that was a Lyceum lecturer. So he delivered lectures informed by and extending the ideas in nature, you know, between the Ohio River and the Atlantic endlessly for years. Um, the ideas that were in nature, um, you know, this was the first set of American intellectual ideas shared beyond a small elite, almost in the, in the nation's history. Um, Emerson was influential in early 19th, early to mid 19th century in America that we can barely fathom now. Um, his ideas were like water. Right, I mean, and not, and not just in the, in the sense of people knowing of those ideas, but people internalizing them and acting upon them. I think that's the next, the next step of it is, is the influence that he actually wielded and the amount of direct connection you can draw from people's own statements about the influence of that text on what it was that they were doing and how they were thinking and, and the choices that they made. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty rare. And I think it's also important to note, and you, you really you know, dive into that is how it was providing a secularization, a form of secularization for the new American population, this way of, of shifting power away from religious institutions to the individual. And it's really the cementing of that concept of individualism. So there are two parts of that that are really important, right? One, uh, in 1836, when Emerson writes Nature, Americans had had their primary intellectual discourse through Protestant churches for two and a half generations longer for people who'd been here longer. Um, Protestantism dominated American intellectual discourse. Churches were as important to political discourse. Um, well, probably, I mean, more important than they are now, although they're pretty important now too, right? Um, and then the, the uh, Second part of that is um, the, uh, th th this is a period when America is growing up, expanding massively and forming a common culture. And Emerson badly wanted that culture to be all American and not just a knockoff of what Europe did. And by ex by arguing for a secularization of American culture, by, by, by beginning to have a discourse outside Protestantism, 
he was he was arguing that America could have America could have its own constructs, its own conversations, and build its own, you know, feel its, you know, grow up a bit, grow up right. a lot, and so and so it, it, nature is to a substantial degree an argument for how America should grow the f up, um, pull up its pants, and take its place as a major cultural entity within the world. Um, and he argues most of all that America should use and build from American nature, um, build America's culture from American nature. And of course, nature, the word has two meanings, nature, trees, birds, but also human nature. So there's right away in this book, a word game. Um, the, across 15,000 words, Emerson plays every word game he can find to play. Um, Practically every major point in the book is built from a, a word or a three word phrase that might have five different meanings. And that's intentional. Um, he's, he's, he's both pointing to Amer America's flora and fauna, but he's also arguing that Americans themselves have the right stuff, that, that the human nature of Americans, and of course he means white, white Americans and he mostly means white male Americans, um, that, that Americans have right and special stuff, that they have the capacity for self-government that they are, of course, then exercising. Um, I wonder if, if you could show us the Carlton Watkin image of uh, Mount Watkins and Mirror Lake, because I think it's a good place to start showing some of the imagery that you're relating. And, and also while you're doing that, I'll explain to people the kind of the format of the book. It, it's a uh, it's a great format in the sense that there's, you know, introductory essays where your argument is being presented and then you include the entirety of the text of nature. And so it's not that you have to have a separate book and you're flipping back and forth, but you, you get the text of nature and Tyler has organized it in a way that you get to see the images that are illustrating the points that Emerson is pursuing. And Zoom the conversation is, is great. Zoom is telling me I cannot share images. I am going to make, there you go, try that. And okay. And so, you know, from a reader's perspective of the book, uh, you, get, you get Emerson's text and you get the images and then you get some insight uh, from Tyler's research about why those images are pertinent and how they relate to the text. And so it's a great illustration of, just how artists were taking this text and creating a visual language to share with 19th century Americans. And, and back to Tyler's point, you know, Emerson was really focused on white America, white male America being from a Anglo-Saxon or England based heritage that was now in a new land to do things in their own way. And so we can't, we can't get away from, white race theory that Emerson has supported and what the foundation of this sort of ideology really entailed. And so you wanna tell us about this particular photograph, Tyler? Oh, this is, I, for me, this is one of the great works of 19th century American art. Um, this is a picture Carlton Watkins makes in Yosemite Valley in either 1865 or 1866, we don't know which. Um, he makes it, probably after he knows that Frederick Law Olmsted has asked the state of California to name that mountain for him. Um, Frederick Law Olmsted has just written his landmark draft report defining what a national park would be. He wrote this report at the request of the governor of California after the federal government granted Yosemite to the state for the purpose of preserving it um, as a national park. Um, I, for, for me, the um, Yosemite idea, as it is known, is a manifestation of Emerson's definition of landscape. It is the first time in American history that a federal government, um, indeed a first time in Western history, that a federal government had preserved a landscape from, removed it from the possibility of commercial development because it was beautiful. Um, because, um, uh, you know, embedded in Emerson's definition of landscape is the English commons idea that a piece of land can be shared by all for whatever purpose. Um, you know, uh, cows could eat grass on it, a meeting could be held on it, whatever. 
um, the Yosemite idea extends that idea through Emerson's definition of landscape to the Yosemite Valley. So in 18, um, what, one of the things that Emerson does, what, one of the key constructs across nature is that, um, is, is, is the use of the reflection metaphor. Um, so Emerson has told Americans to build their culture from American nature. And then he gives them specific ways to do that. And so one of them is, it's, it's crucially important to Emerson, indeed to all Americans, uh, at least all white Americans in um, the 1830s, that America is the only republic in the world. It is, Americans are the only uh, self-governed people in the world. They, they don't answer to a monarch. Um, the, 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 the body politic, white men, and with the exception of like the state of North Carolina, um, non-land, you, 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 you didn't, by this point, you know, Jacksonian democracy had advanced, you no longer had to own land to vote. So pretty much all white men could vote. Um, the American Republican, in the American Republican experiment, the government and indeed the federal state reflected, reflected uh, the electorate. And so Emerson dozens of times across nature builds these reflection metaphors, one half of something reflecting the other half of something. Um, two things joined in an, in an, irrecon in an inseparable whole. Um, and, and not only does Emerson do this in nature in 1836, but in later essays, he expands on this reflection metaphor, famously through the soul and the oversoul that Marsden Hartley loved so much. Um, and so I, I strongly, firmly believe that Watkins uh, was converted to Emerson and Emersonianism by Thomas Starr King, who was an Emerson acolyte in Boston, traveled the Lyceum circuit with Emerson, worshiped the ground Emerson walked upon. Um, Starr King moves to San Francisco in 1860 to, to um, uh, both uh, build Unitarianism in San Francisco, but also to build capital R Republicanism. Um, and I believe Watkins comes to Emerson's ideas through Starr King. And they immediately, like within a year, enter Emer uh, Watkins's work. So I think it's no coincidence that as, em as Watkins is in the Yosemite Valley in August-ish of 1865, as the war is, is concluding and the Union is being reunified, that Watkins makes a series of pictures. This is the greatest one, at least in my book, um, uh, of uh, the landscape reflected in the water, in this case, Mirror Lake, um, pointing to two things in Republicanism, which had just triumphed through the Northern victory in the Civil War. Um, the, the, the will of the people is reflected by their government. And of course, the nation itself um, in 1865 is uh, in the process of being reunified. And I think that's all within uh, this picture, uh, one, of, one of Watkins' greatest. And we know, of course, Watkins made sure we know, we, we know that this was not a darkroom trick. Um, down there in the lower right-hand corner, just above the lower right-hand corner, if you look closely, you'll see a twig. Um, Watkins made sure, and often did in these reflection pictures, to include a twig um, sitting on the water so you'd know he wasn't faking it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty great. I mean, so one of the things that, you know, comes through really clearly and you're writing about the artworks is the roadmap that Emerson's really creating for artists to work from. So he, he's literally spelling out things that artists can do and that people can do in order to advance these ideas in a, in a visual way. And, you know, one of the early reviews that you cite of nature was that it was um, an aesthetic, uh, an aesthetical rather than philosophical book. And I think Isn't that, that was- a, is a really important thing. I mean, who would, who would get a review like that today? <laughs> and it's of any. My, my other, I have to, I have to, I have to quickly jump in with my other favorite review or criticism of nature. Andrews Norton, who's a Harvard professor, the Harvard religion professor, when Nature is published, you know, Norton is is a Unitarian, and and the Bible is really important to Norton, and and the Bible had been central to American philosophical and indeed political discourse for fifty years. And what really freaked out Norton about nature is that Emerson over and over again is exhorting Americans to use, to use metaphors drawn from nature to address the American nation. And for Norton, 
Norton specifically complains about this damn metaphor thing. Kids these days and their metaphors. Um, and he thinks metaphors are dangerous because it reduces the import and centrality of the Bible. Um, so it's another way in which Emerson is in metaphor, which we don't think of as being a secular thing. Um, but metaphor was one way in which Emerson was insisting on, on a, a secular philosophical and political discourse for the nation. Right. Damn and metaphors. It, damn metaphors. And it really reinforces that individualism and individualistic pursuit idea. You know, and he's saying, you know, use nature as the, as the guide for what it is you pursue and how you pursue it. But there's really that individualism and that American exceptionalism that's being promoted at this time. And, you know, it's it, the other thing to kind of talk about a little bit too right here, I think, especially given the last image we looked at is the federal government is setting aside lands that belong to Native Americans predominantly and and they're absorbing and it's this western expansion towards gathering and gobbling up land that it does not it's the dispossession of native american land that becomes a big part of what a lot of emerson's nature um, is paving the right to do and, and and so when we look at you know say something like um uh the holy cross images uh, Thomas Moran and the, the photography of uh, Jenkins, I believe it was. Is that right? Um, uh, William Henry Jackson. Jackson. And, you know, and if you could show everyone those. I will call those up. It business. really, you know, for me, when I was looking through the book and, and saw those and thinking about it in, in this context, it makes it abundantly clear what the intention was, you know, especially when you start to learn to see the work through the visual language of the time period, you know, and I think it's pretty rare to have a, a Rosetta Stone of sorts, as we do with Emerson's nature, to be able to read this artwork. You know, I mean, he—it's literally a manual to read this work by, and you know, so when when you have that to think about it, and you start thinking about the context of the time and everything else that was going on with westward expansion, and you know, the disposition of native lands to either the federal government or private landholders, images like this really take on new meaning. Yeah, so I'm trying to get the, the images of the Moran are too big on my computer somehow for Zoom to be. Um, <laughs> Zoom doesn't like it. They're very large TIFF files, so Zoom is objecting. Um, shoot, I won't do it. Um, so let me describe them, I'm sorry. They're, I'm not sure why that's a problem for Zoom, but it's sending me messages about the file size. Um, because it should just mirror my screen. I'm not sure why it's not doing that. Um, the, 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 um, the story of, um, Emerson's involvement with American and colonial dispossession of native peoples goes back to 1635. Ah, there we go. Thank you. That's, that's the Moran. Um, and how were you able to do that? And I'm not. The internet, I just pulled up a web page with it. <laughs> it's the way Great, it works. thank I you. I don't know why. I mean, you know, the, the Watkins image I think is bigger than the Jackson image. I don't I know why. So. Um, I'll pull that the, in, in 1635, Emerson gives um, the 200th anniversary, I'm sorry, in 1835, Emerson delivers a lecture in Concord, Mass. to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the town of Concord. And in so doing, he reads um, a lot of Concord's history. He's just moved to this town. He's a brand new resident of Concord, Mass. and he wants to impress his new neighbors with what he knows about this town he's joining. And he learns the early history of, um, of who had lived in Concord before the English colonists um, got there and um, understands and roots his story in John Winthrop's 1619 declaration that Native American, and this goes for all of Massachusetts and really all of New England, that Native Americans did not have claim to their own land um, because they did not improve it through agriculture, which was false. You know, as Joan Didion would later say, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. In American history, we tell ourselves stories in order to steal, too. 
Um, and uh, Winthrop's um, formulation came from Genesis, which said that to own land, you have, I'm shortcutting here, but, but to own land, you have to improve it and you improve it through European style agriculture. Um, in 1823, this idea migrates into American law through the Supreme Court when Chief Justice John Marshall wrote a decision by which he concluded the Native American tribes essentially had no property rights because none of them, none of them, right, um, practiced European style agriculture and improved the land upon the, which they lived by growing things in the ground and then eating them, which of course they did. They almost all of them did, um, but, but it was the legal justification for uh, the wave of 19th century dispossession to come for what would be the 1830 Removal Act, Indian Removal Act of Andrew Jackson's, the 1832 Black Hawk War, which is essentially the same set of ideas extended in a different way across the upper Mississippi Valley. Um, and so these things are going on as Emerson is coming to the realization he's going to be an independent intellectual and has a book he would like to write. And these are the very ideas um, he extends. The, 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 his, his, his concepts of who American land will be for comes from Winthrop and comes from Marshall. Um, and one of the ways in which Americans will, and indeed especially American artists, is to claim uh, indigenous land for the United States culturally will be to extend symbols of um, the American nation and its faith tradition upon the land, which is why uh, the Mountain of the Holy Cross in Colorado and the Rockies is such a popular image for Moran and is such a popular image for William Henry Jackson, who is you know, the, the leading photographer and image maker of um, kind of the, the, the Great Lakes, Ohio Valley region. Um, and we, we see the extension of um, American Protestantism and other markers of the American nation across scores, if not hundreds, probably thousands of American paintings and photographs of the mid 19th century. My, my favorite weird little example, which you can really only see well in the actual painting at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, although it's in the book, um, John Kensett in a painting of the Hudson River Valley um, and the Hudson River, uh, which of course had been Mohawk land before Americans, uh, white Americans, European Americans moved in, um, includes uh, in his scene in the left, on the left-hand side, two trees arranged in such a way as to build, represent um, a Pieta, um, a, a, a classic Christian form on, on the American land. This was not Kensett's idea, Thomas Cole had done it previously um, an idea which remarkably exists nowhere in the Cole Scholarship except in an Instagram post by Betsy Jacks, who is the executive director of the Thomas Cole National Historic Site, which is where I learned about it. So I got to write my favorite footnote of all time citing an Instagram post. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but so yeah, that's th those are some of the ways um, America culturally claimed uh, the land that had been colonially, uh, philosophically, and then legally claimed by, by uh, the British crown and then by, by the American government. So for you, when, um, when you're thinking about the exposure of these images, you know, how, in your research, how widely viewed were a lot of these works in, in the form of their original? like the paintings themselves. Were these, were these widely displayed? Were they intended for more of an educated elite audience um, in those early days, especially in the earlier days, like the pre-Civil War time period? Depends on the pictures, um, depends on the pictures. So a, a, a couple things. One, um, I'm probably remiss before now in referring to all Americans over and over again. Um, the audience Emerson cared about, the audience that read Emerson, um, the audience that was indeed engaged with, with the paintings and artworks we're showing is an entirely Northern audience. Um, Southerners by, by, by this time, by the end of the Mexican-American War were already intensely restricting the flow of Northern ideas into the South through the policing of the males. 
Um, and, and while there were Southerners who traveled to New York and surely saw Frederick Church's paintings, for example, um, those paintings were not widely seen in the South. Church's famous Twilight in the Wilderness, for example, was purchased by a Southern sympathizer in Baltimore, William Walters, um, whose son will go on to found the, William, the Walters Art Museum. Um, Walters is, is a, a Southern sympathizer. He will be pro-Confederate in Baltimore, buys Church's Twilight of the Wilderness, an 1860 painting heralding the coming of civil war, which I can try to show you. Um, one of the great paintings in um, American history. It is um, uh, I don't know why it's not letting me show you again. Um, but it is this painting. Uh, that's a detail from it. Is that working? That's working. Okay. I don't know why I won't let me. I mean, I, it's weird. Um, the uh, Walters Walters buys this painting and uh, kind of a couple of years later, I think in 1862, realized it's a, a, a painting warning of the coming of war from a very pointedly northern perspective, full of Emersonian metaphors, and quickly sells it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so arguably. Church's master, well, Church's masterpiece, and arguably, uh, you know, one of the two or three greatest paintings of pre-Civil War America. And Walter sells it because he realizes he's <laughs> done an ideological and sectional no-no. Um. Well, the other thing I like about it is that <laughs> he understood the metaphor. He didn't get it at first, but he was able to read the painting at after yeah. closer inspection and understand that it was in contrast to his own personal ideals. There's so, the reflection metaphor in, in the water. There's the sunset metaphor, which is enormously prominent in American painting from 1849 on, warning of uh, day passing into night, borrowed from Milton. Um, and of course, uh, with night comes uncertainty and painting after painting, American painters warn of uncertainty for the American Republican project. And of course, as we get closer to 1861, warning of the war itself. Um, so how, how well are these paintings known? Yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's a good question. Um, so many of them are known through print culture. Um, there was a thriving um, print business, but also, you know, for, for intellectual New York, intellectual Easterners in New York and Boston, seeing major paintings such as, as Twilight and others is um, uh, socially and intellectually important. Um, they're on view, you know, church, puts these paintings on view and charges a dime or a quarter to see them and tens of thousands of people do in both Boston and New York. So among the, um, you know, just, just as today, among the American intellectual intelligentsia, they traffic pretty well. Um, they, they, they traffic, you know, we, we can see through um, newspapers that these paintings are very, are so familiar to Californians who have never seen them they're familiar through their descriptions and print cultures that they can be referred to in newspapers in ways that, it's obvious that newspapers know that their audience knows what they're, know, understand the paintings they're talking about and indeed the metaphors within them. Right. Um, so they're important as physical objects, they're important uh, through print culture, but they're also important for the ideas that are within them, um, which can be discussed absent, you know, a, a whiskey seller in San Francisco having seen the painting. The ideas are made familiar through the visuals and the visuals are discussed and reinforce the ideas. Right. And so I think, you know, is a, is a key point to understanding 19th century American art, especially landscape art, art inspired by Emerson, is that it was intended to be read and it was intended to prompt a discussion. And that that was really a major part of the pursuit of Emerson's work was to inspire the artists of his day whether it be writers poets and to inspire painters. the readers to understand what they were exactly. looking at too right? right i mean you know i think one of the, i think the key thing about what you just said um so sometimes when i when i talk about these ideas in front of art historians or students they're like well how do you know people in the 19th century understood these paintings this way because when i read the review in the new york times they're not describing they're not explaining the metaphor to me like you are. And I'm like, well, when you read a New York Times review of The Daily Show, does the New York Times explain the joke? No, because the New York Times reviewer understands that you have the cultural context to understand the joke. Therefore, 
it presents the joke and knows you have the cultural literacy, the contemporary cultural literacy to, to, to follow along. And in 19th century America, when, um, you know, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, when metaphor is everything in poetry and fiction from the pulpit um, in art, um, that kind of literacy was um, as understood as John Stewart's jokes were during, during, you know, his run of the Daily Show. Right. I mean, I think, you know, when we, when we think of other like poetry of the time, it's, it's loaded with metaphor as well that a lot of literary critics will spend volumes yes. explaining the metaphors right, yes. for a contemporary audience, which is not happening, so to speak, with contemporary poetry of, of people writing volumes to explain the metaphors for today. And I think it, it explains that point that the work was decidedly of its time for its time. And it had this map of everyone, and including this, you know, going back to your point of who everyone was, which were a more elite Northern white male audience, understood the language because they had read Emerson's Nature. And they yeah, had, and, and, and heard Emerson lecture. And heard Emerson lecture. So they, they had a better skill set, a better base education in order to be able to look at this work and then be influenced by it and have and those heard, ideas and, reinforced. And heard Emerson's circle of influencees extend those ideas, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Thomas Starr King um, and Frederick Henry, uh, Fred, Frederick Hedge and, and all of these people in Emerson's orbit who were part of a thriving lyceum preaching, poetry writing, novel writing community. Um, uh, this was the culture to which Emerson urged Americans in 1836 was by the mid to late 1840s, the dominant American culture. You know, and I think the thing to, to point out really too is that it wasn't artists just influencing other artists. These artists were influencing the policy makers and decision makers of their day. I mean, especially when you get to the foundation and the formation of national parks, it's, it's, it's the photographs that help instill the idea that we need to save and preserve this. It's the paintings, it's all the groundwork that nature had done as a, as a text to prepare people to see those photographs in a specific way. Not to see it as commodity, but to see it as this embodiment of the American experiment. And so I think that's really the important thing to say here. It's, it's not just artists making great work and selling it to rich people, it's artists actually influencing the policymakers of the day with the work that they're doing. So when Watkins shows you um, a photograph of Yosemite like, um, oh, what's a good, well, here's an image that works in a very specific way. Do I wanna do this one? Let's do this one. Um, so what we were just saying about how Church's Niagara was, famous and ubiquitous almost from the moments of its making in 1857 through print culture and through having been described in newspapers and everybody knew what it was. So by 1861, when Watkins is in Yosemite, he's never probably ever, never seen the painting, almost certainly has never seen Church's painting, but he can make a Western Niagara that refers to it. This is, this is um, the Merced River racing um, across uh, above the Yosemite Valley. But another thing this, this picture does is it builds on that metaphor culture we're, we're, we're discussing. So Oliver Wendell Holmes writes the major pain, uh, poem of the Civil War era called Brother Jonathan's Lament for Sister Caroline. Brother Jonathan was a slang term for a New Englander, a Yankee, Sister Caroline, SC, South Carolina. Um, and it's a, a poem in which um, Holmes composes landscape, American nature, into a metaphor for American union. Um, and he points to how uh, water and forests and mountain and sky are inseparable from each other. And we see them in single views and understand that, that both nature and providence, God, are providing us with an argument for union. Classic Emersonian textbook stuff. 
And so uh, when Watkins goes to Yosemite in 1861, over and over again, he builds uh, images, um, builds compositions from this union of features um, in single pictures, which seems obvious to us now, but it's obvious to us now because people like Watkins um, did it. It hadn't been, been done before that. You know, before Watkins is in Yosemite, people are building images from uh, just single features. They're zooming in on them so much in paintings or photographs that all you see is cathedral rocks. You don't see that there's water below it and sky above it. Um, so this is, um, you know, I, I, the more we understand about how and why images are constructed in this period, the more we go back um, and, and, and I think should understand them as um, being in dialogue with Emerson's ideas in nature from 1836, from 25 years earlier. So one of the other things that um, I really thought was telling was when people were actually included in the landscapes, who oh, was included <laughs> and, you know, and why they were there. And there's the, the William Lewis Sontag uh, on the Potomac, which you, you know, you talk well about in the book where the, the figures are wearing red, white, and blue cloaks. <laughs> you know, you kind of can't get any more uh, go America, especially being that it's the Potomac is the view that we have, you know, the famous, you know, wa you know Washington and Potomac. And to me, you know, the fact that the vast majority of the work of the period is devoid of people. And when people are present, it's either people improving the land or using the land. You know, and you, you might not think much about it just in looking at the work of, as a casual viewer, but in looking at that in context with Emerson's nature, it starts to take on a wildly different meaning of who this land is for. And, you know, we kind of can't stress that enough with Emerson and his way of seeing and being in the world of really promoting that America was for white men. And that everyone else pretty much get out of the way. And, you know, it's when you look at one of these scenes, especially the, the Sontag painting, it's, it's so clear on with that lens, with that appropriate lens, that that's what this is about. And once you have that visual language, you begin to learn it. These paintings take on wildly different meanings, just at the, even at first glance. And then you know, the more you dig into them, the more you start to see and read. You know, it's worth noting that this use of red, white, and blue, um, so it's a dead giveaway in American 19th century painting when you see people wearing red, white, and blue that the artist is telling you that he or she is making a painting that's an address of the American nation. But Frederick Church especially will extend this into the land as well. So this is a painting from either 51 or 52, um, a series of three almost identically sized sunset paintings that Church makes to install in the annual show at the National Academy of Design. Um, and they're all sunset pictures and they're all a warning about um, the looming sectional crisis coming in the wake of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ends the Mexican-American War and begins to expand slavery across the Southern tier of the continent. And then the Compromise of 1850, which admits California into the Union and expands massively the um, Fugitive Slave Act. And, and, and in, in this painting, uh, you can't miss the church's sunset is red, white, and blue. He's warning about the sunset of American republicanism and the idea of the American nation. Um, so it happens absolutely in um, uh, in, in, in paintings with people, even in painters who aren't normally inclined to metaphor like Bierstadt. Um, but it, it, it is extended into the land itself when possible too, <laughs> which is wild. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, uh, this is also that time period where Native Americans are not necessarily all that represented but when they are, it's for really specific purposes. And, and in, in, in view of nature, how, what would be the purpose of including a Native American within the landscape for one of the artists of this day? 
uh, you don't. Um, so when white artists are painting, so, so I get, first we should point out that um, it was really important to white America to control images of Native Americans. Um, so when Native Americans uh, of all sorts of tribes from all parts of the country come to Washington in the 1820s, 30s and afterward, um, their portraits are often painted. Um, and, and, and in so doing, um, the federal government uh, and its adjuncts gain control of those images and use them in specific ways. The most, um, I think, what should be the most notorious example in probably American history was um, when Black Hawk was captured, um, the, the Sauk chief um, after the 1832 Black Hawk War and was interned in prison at Jefferson Barracks, the headquarters of the US Army in the American West, Jefferson Barracks, just, just south of the city of St. Louis. Um, uh, painters shuffled through to paint Black Hawk um, uh, and in and, and painting after painting, of course, hide that he's imprisoned. Um, and then as Black Hawk was toured around the country, essentially as, as a captured prisoner as war booty by the Jackson administration and other artists in other parts of the country were given access to him for the same purpose. Um, you know, in, in, in by 21st and 20th century standards, um, that would itself be a war crime. Right. Um, so the primary uh, way in which white America captured and disseminated images of Native Americans in the 19th century was as a way of controlling um, the image and making arguments about who and what Native Americans were and weren't, um, such as not civilized, air quotes, civilized, um, and, and therefore not fit for self-government. Um, the, um, when we see Native Americans in the landscape in, in 19th century American art, um, I don't know, there's not, it, it's really hard to talk about there being one form of representation. Um, Albert Bierstadt in 1859 painting at the Detroit um, Institute of Arts paints red, white, and blue clad figures, American settlers, we, we read them as crossing a river, the Wolf River in Kansas, and walking up a hill and advancing on, um, uh, I, I don't know that Bierstadt was thinking of specific native people, but he's, he's created a tableau that we are to read as, as wilderness and Native American, uh, which, which in the context of the time was considered the same thing. Um, uh, and that Americans were moving on uh, moving in on 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 those people, the, the, those people that that Bierstadt doesn't specify either with what he's showing or certainly not in textual means. Um, there, you know, there's there, there there is a lot of work for American art historians to do, both around the Native American portraits, starting in the 1820s, the Charlesburg King pictures, and 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 on, um, and probably even more work to do on. Um, pictures of Native Americans in the landscape. I think the most notorious type is what I call the entrance into paintings, paintings that American painters start making in the, in the late 1850s um, that tell the story of European people um, arriving in North America um, and encountering Native Americans. Um, and I think these are often discussed in terms of um, more factuality than those pictures um, d d merit. Um, th these are less, I think, pictures about um, Native Americans than they are about expanding the definition of whiteness in America and expanding what white people are included in American polity. When you see the picture, uh, the Emanuel Leutze of Lord Baltimore entering Maryland at the Maryland Historical Society or whatever they've renamed the Maryland Historical Society, it's called something else now. Um, that's, that's a picture of Catholicism joining the American project um, at a time painted just before the Civil War as Irish and Italians were flowing into the United States. Um, I think these pictures are really complicated. 
um, and uh, and probably the more those complications are unpacked, the more uncomfortable we should be about them. I mean, I think that's one of the one of the good parts about the book for me is that there's a lot of points to step off from to continue digging, right? It's a really good um, first salvo of saying, hey, this is here and we should know more about it. And I, and I think, you know, to me, you know, it's, it's the whitewashing of the building of, the, of American idealism and the concept of American exceptionalism and that, that uh, white supremacist Protestant view of America that is still holds such weight and sway today on how that foundation was actually achieved through this type, this sort of means. And I think it, you know, it's, it's not an understatement to say that Emerson's nature and the artists that were helping to visualize that and continue the conversation to keep the conversation of that going really laid that foundation that we're still dealing with today, that we're still trying to unpack today. And we don't necessarily even have the understanding of why people feel this way or where it came from. But this really starts to open up a window into where it came from and the That's why I wrote the book. of it. That's why I wrote the book. I mean, to, to serve as a foundation for the work I have planned over the next decade, um, you know, in, in, in investigating how American art um, was both influential within the American nation, such as with the invention of the National Park at Yosemite during the Civil War, but also in terms of how American art contributed to the construction of whiteness in American polity, to making whiteness, to embedding whiteness in, at the heart of American polity. And I hope um, that one of the things the book does is motivate students and art historians and artists too, for that matter, um, to um, build out from these links in their own work. I mean, in, in, in the book, you know, there, there are probably six to 10 metaphors that are really dominant in American painting um, that, that follow the instructions Emerson laid out to, to nature, to metaphor. And I think I, I foregrounded two or three or four of them in the book, but there are others. Um, and I hope that like one of the things, you know, to be specific, for example, I have one of the things the book does is motivates and helps art historians um, begin to unpack those metaphors and then the influence of uh, the, um, the influence these artists had on how the idea of the American nation was constructed and then extended. Right, and, and to the tune that it influenced policy that we're still dealing with. I mean, I think that's a big part of it as well is, is the is how this work helped ingrain that ideology in a way that we're still trying to understand the policies that were generated from that, from this time when we're still doing or, or even just ideas or even just ideas that were so pervasive. You know, the, the great example is the vanishing Indian myth, which mm -hmm. is the 19th century American idea that, oh, all of those Native Americans are going to die off. So who cares how we treat them and we should just go take their land. Um, and it's probably impossible to point to a beginning point for the construction of the vanishing Indian myth, but certainly George Catlin is, is writing about it when he, in his essays for New York newspapers in the 1820s or 30s. Um, and, and Catlin in the first Catlin essay, Catlin essay I know of about it, uh, 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 where, where, where Catlin writes uh, about the idea that Indians will inevitably die off, which of course they didn't and haven't. Um, he, 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 he specifically uses a metaphor built around a sunset. And as we get into the, you know, the, Amer the, the, the sunset metaphor is, is primary in American painting up until the Civil War when it warns of the war. And then it kind of goes away late in the war and it comes back with a vengeance. Um, after the yeah. Civil War, as Americans are crossing the Mississippi and moving west, and it is in scores and hundreds of paintings of Native Americans and um, Native American residences and graveyards. Um, you can you can guess how those graveyards got there, by the way. Yeah. Um, and and so the sunset metaphor after the Civil War is used to extend the vanishing Indian myth. Um, 
so you can so so we should think of Emerson's nature as a kind of source book for American artists and broader American culture across the 19th century and indeed into the 1920s and 30s. Yeah, I mean because it's um it's 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 hard to understate the influence of images in this time period because especially when it comes to print and we were talking a little bit about this earlier before we came on Thomas Moran was widely reproduced in the form of chroma lithographs you know so uh, Louis Prang and company reproduced his Yosemite watercolors he actually commissioned and then he, he asked Moran and eventually harangued him and commissioned him into creating a series of watercolors of the paintings he had made of Yosemite so that he could make amazingly high quality reproductions at a large format so that they could be mass disseminated so some of these images by some of these artists were definitely ubiquitous and common culture and when we think about how um, print print and the explosion of lithography and printing in the united states really created a inexpensive accessible image commodity for the average american something that was very inexpensive to buy and a, something you could put up in your home uh, a lot of the visualization of of what these artists were doing had a more outsized influence than we might think of just somebody going to a museum and the patronage class that was going to them and so the, the first museum proposed things. the first museum proposed to be built in san francisco which was basically you know a storefront sized space um was to be filled entirely with famous chromolithographs um churches niagara and whatnot um and it was advertised or promised in newspapers of the day that exactly what you're describing is what anybody could come and see for like a dime or a nickel. And, and so, I mean, I think for, for a contemporary audience, that's, that's the Instagram, that's the quick yeah. look. It's the ease of accessibility of the day. And, and so the artist had a more outsized influence than we may really understand or see as artists influence on wider culture today as far as that more immediacy and, and they're more, more commonly known. Um, more of these artists were known by a much wider audience than say ex even extraordinarily famous artists today are not known by a wide American audience, um, especially if the images are known, um, they're not necessarily sure what that visual language is saying to them. You know, when you think of how widely known Andy Warhol may be to the general American public, most of that general American public is not versed in the visual language that he was speaking and what he was actually having to say with his work as just being a quick and easy example. But, and so it's, I think a really unique period of time. And for me, it's just like, when I read this, I just had more questions. I think to me, it was a good, a good, good. sign <laughs> um, when reading it. And I good. encourage all of you to, dive into this and it's something I wanted to talk to you about too is, is the layout of this book because it's a really different structure as far as book design is concerned um, and I just wanted to get a little bit of your thoughts on how you arrived at this particular way of presenting the information. Um, Anjali Pala um, designed the book um, and did just a glorious job. I've never had more fun working with anybody or any set of people on a project like this as, as I had on this one. Um, I noticed in reading scholars tackle Emerson over the years um, that everybody loved, like Emerson wrote, you know, I'm gonna get these numbers wrong, but you know, he wrote, you know, 20 books and delivered, you know, scores of lectures and his correspondence and journals have been published in like 40 volumes. I mean, the guy wrote so many words over so many decades that you can almost let him say, make him say anything you want to. Um, and other Emersonian, Emer other Emerson scholars have noted that Emerson is today far more read about than read. And I love, you know, he writes in a way, you know, em Emerson, can read as chewy to us. Um, but then, you know, think about it this way. Emerson's nature is almost as old to us as Shakespeare was to Emerson. Um, language and use, usage have changed. Um, and so I thought that the way to best 
share the ideas at the core of Emerson's really career long project um, was, was to present them in full. And I think, I hope that one of the things that lessens the chewiness of the text is that we've included, I think it's 60 paintings and photographs that I think at some level were informed by Emerson's work um, within line of Emerson's text. So as you're flipping through the 15,000 words that make up nature, every page or two, you get a painting and then you get a caption and you know, three or 400 words from me about what Emerson is writing about and how the painter or the photographer is engaging with it. Um, and I, I think the way art historians would traditionally point to Emerson's influence on painters you know, it would be with like an 800 word essay on a painting and a phrase, and then another 900 words on a photograph and a phrase and another, you know, and I've read those books and learned from them, but they do go on a bit. Um, and so I thought just letting Emerson and the painters be in conversation with each other was more faithful to how ideas flowed. I mean, I, and I tried to, me, to add mine. Yeah, to me, it really felt more like the 19th century experience of it. So you have the text and you're getting to see what other people were seeing who were reading the text in the time. And it, I think it helps um, teach that vernacular in a way because you're, you're getting to see it visually, which was the intention of the text in a lot of ways. And to me, it really points towards you know, things that were missing in today's visual language and visual vernacular as, as an ability to, to learn from it and to get to learn along with it. And I feel like, you know, it's a, it was a good decision because, and, and one that as, as, a, as you would say, it would be a rarity to have to allow Emerson to speak for himself rather yeah. than you speak for him, right? And then to let the paintings um, to just help guide people through the paintings, which is what it, what it, what you do with the with the captions for the paintings, and and in that there, way, it's a there is a, there a is a fifteen thousand there is a fifteen thousand word essay by me at the beginning of the book that builds the foundation for what what's going to happen across the rest of the book. But but yeah, I, there's a lot of letting Emerson in the pictures talk. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a it was a it's a good decision for us to be able to understand a bit more and, and for me and having read it you come out with a, a wildly different view of the united states as a result of it and you know it really makes you start to wonder about you know what's doing the bulk of influencing in our own time that we may not really understand is doing that level of influencing because we're in the middle of it and because there are things that are doing thing doing what this is doing to us today you know oh, yeah. and influencing that and so you know one of the things the way you end the book i think is a great you know way for people to to jump off which is the shift after the first world war when art really shift in this kind of rejection of emerson's nature concept for america and i wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that because i think that's it's important it's an important point to know that this was it was a, it was a finite period in in, in nature, of course, as we've discussed, Emerson offers nature as the way the idea of the American nation should be expressed. And the culture buys in um, for what seems to me like an unusually long time. Um, Emerson writes nature in 1836. Nature artists really begin picking up from it in the early to mid, mid to late 1840s, 45, 46. And it remains primary um, you know, well into the 19 teens. Um, and then we get to the precisionists. And I saw that there was, I, you know, I love precisionism. I love Sheeler and Strand and, um, and all those, those painters and early avant-garde filmmakers. Um, and I noticed that um, there, there was a show at the, at the De Young organized by Emma Acker five or six years ago called Cult of the Machine. 
and it was a survey of precisionism that expanded the thing beyond just painting. So it included film, uh, industrial design, and more. And um, as I was walking through the show, I kept finding quotations from nature and pictures everywhere. So it wasn't just that industry was replacing nature as the great American thing, to use the art historian Wanda Korn's phrase, but it was how uh, American painters were doing that. So Scheler makes that famous 1929-1930 uh, commission for the Ford Motor Company uh, based around their River Rouge plant um, outside Detroit. And Scheler titles one picture American Landscape and in another he uh, remakes the reflection metaphor by having a factory uh, reflected I think in some wastewater from the factory. You know he's just playing on Emerson's sandbox. Uh, my favorite example is a painting that Sheeler paints, I think, in 1946, called The Artist Paints from Nature. Paints from Nature! Um, <laughs> Sheeler does this over and over again, little nods to Emerson and his titles. And it's a painting of um, Sheeler in, um, in, in a backyard, um, and it is, it is uh, fenced in, unlike um, Emerson's landscape description, everything's fenced in, private property rights have triumphed. Um, uh, Emerson in his definition of landscape inserts himself into the definition by writing in the first person. Sheeler inserts himself into the picture, which is at the Art Institute of Chicago, um, as because he's painting a wood stove. Part of Emerson's definition of landscape had included a reference to woodlots, which is where Farmers in Concord and people who lived in town in Concord kept an acre or two of forest so they could go cut down a tree and burn it to stay warm when they wanted to. Um, Sheeler, in his painting, The Artist Looks at Nature, he's, he's making a drawing or a painting of a wood stove, which was the exact thing that um, uh, burned up those woodlots and paved the way for the suburbanization we see in Sheeler's painting. And then in case we miss it, Sheeler in the very upper left corner of the painting paints a red, white, and blue structure. Red, white, and blue. Um, and so as you go through precisionist painting and indeed avant-garde film like, like Manhattan, the, the Sheeler Strand project, right. um, you see reference after reference after reference to Protestantism, power, power poles in the shape of a cross, and to Emerson's ideas um, in titles and compositions and subjects. Um, I would um, like, I, I can almost guarantee you anybody who reads the epilogue to the book, um, which starts with Sheeler and Strand's Manhattan, you know, read those six paragraphs or eight paragraphs or whatever in the book, and then call up Manhattan on YouTube and you will have what I had, which is a series of aha moments in which exactly what Sheeler and Strand are doing shot by shot by shot by shot becomes clear once you've read nature. Um, it's, it's just larded with references and usurpings and overthrowings of, um, of the American culture that Emerson had constructed. Right. I mean, and it was not only just a tossing out, but it was, you know, it was a group that had largely benefited from, from the Emerson period and the policies and so they were in a position to be able to afford to toss it and, and come up with their own. And I think that idea, when we had talked about it a little bit, that idea that um, that individualism and their own pursuit is the thing that carries through from a lot of what Emerson had started, even though they were rejecting a lot of his ways of looking at the world and the ways of using the world and the purpose of things, that individualism really still reigns true. And that... Um, that concept of, of, of it being for a white audience is also still heavily, you, you see, heavily remained. There, there's ways you see that in American painting just before the precisionists. So those great 1890s, uh, I guess really early 20th century George Ennis paintings of um, suburbs uh, poking through uh, forests and beginning to um, subsume them. Um, they're both sentimental about the forest and um, wetlands and grasslands being eliminated as the suburbs come along. But of course, we we know even before the 1940s who was going to be living in those suburbs. 
um, people culturally constructed as white. Um, uh, and and even in some of those pictures in us even shows us those people. Um, so, you know, you can, you can see this happening in American painting. Um, and of course, Innes was a deeply Emersonian um, painter. They, the, the two of them shared a major point of influence, Emanuel Swedenborg. Um, uh, the, the, um, the cultural and physical, is that a right, is that a phrase? Physical history of the country, you know, really plays out in, in, in these works and reacts to, and then eventually against Emerson. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and when we, when we look at American history and the romanticization of a lot of parts of American history, it's in a, in a lot of ways, the, it's the telling of the story that these paintings are showing. So these, it's, it's the visual that can then be pointed to as this is the proof of the story, so to speak. So the narrative that's being generated. Um, who's included, has, who's not. Who's included, who's not, who it's for, um, and who has the right to. And all of that is being reinforced by the, the images are there to point to as kind of the record, so to speak, even though they are- More, more than that, lives. right? The, the, more than that, the images are being used to usurp other claims to land, for example, right. to, to establish um, Protestant culturally constructed as white American dominance of a space. You know, that's why you get a Pieta on Mohawk land. Right. Um, you know, there, there are all of these ways in which the American project is advanced as primary and victorious, whether it was or not, depending on the part of the country, right? At that, at that moment, um, in, in, in this work, the, the, you know, the, the, because of the, especially now, because of the dominance of the art market, but also you know, because American art history as a discipline was created by white men who collected the work um, and were preserving asset value in, in the histories right. they constructed. Um, the idea of the artist as intellectual who was engaging with and forming his country or her country later on um, is rarely foregrounded in American art history. Um, and we, you know, uh, land, uh, painters and photographers are creating ideas visually and not just pretty pictures of a mountain to be sold. And the project of the historian and the critic is to understand how and why that was done. And so I hope this book tries to do some of that. I mean, yeah, definitely for me it does. And um, I have a question that just came in um, about, you know, were there women painters contributing to this in this time period? And to what extent, uh, or women involved in this conversation um, from the Emerson perspective? Not, you know a, not a lot. You know, women become really influential on Emerson as a thinker later in his career. Um, he's pretty resistant to, um, for example, the abolitionism of Thoreau's sisters and his own wife um, until we get very close to, to the Civil War. Um, uh, you know, Emerson is very slow to abolitionism and he doesn't come to abolitionism because he feels the cause. He comes to abolitionism because a friend of his traveled to South Carolina and was treated rudely. Um, uh, in terms of uh, artists who are women, um, yeah, you do at the end of the 19th century um, have, have some. Um, so um, there are a couple in the book. Um, um, I'm trying to think of um, a marvelous uh, painter of flora, um, isolated against naked a naked background, who's um, uh, Fidelia Bridges um, uh, is 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 in the book, and I would have loved to have had more of her works. The book um, 
includes only images from museums and libraries that have open access policies, which I argue in, in, in the book are indeed an extension of an Emersonian idea. Um, and really the only good Fidelia Bridges image I could find was this one at the National Gallery. Brooklyn, Brooklyn has some Fidelia Bridges, but they haven't been photographed in a, good, in a long time. Um, uh, and then as you get into the 20th century, um, the epilogue um, deals with um, the Baroness Elsa von Freytag, who I don't think was actually a Baroness, but I don't remember. Um, I mean, I should probably just call, start calling myself Baroness because you know, maybe in a hundred years, people won't remember if I'm a Baroness either. Um, uh, but, but she engages Emerson's ideas, um, I argue in a sculpture titled, two sculptures, one titled God, which is a plumbing trap. Um, just Google it and I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to describe what a plumbing trap does. Um, and, uh, and, and a sculpture titled Cathedral, um, which again presented industrial urbanizing America as, um, as having replaced um, both a European construct and Emerson's construction and description of cathedrals within nature, within forests. Um, so yeah, women come in, but it's, at the, it, it, it's as we get to the, the last couple decades of the 19th century and the early 20th century, and um, Emerson would have been a more progressive intellectual if he'd paid attention to the progressive women around him. Um, are there any, if there are any questions that you guys have, go ahead and throw them in the chat because now's a good time uh, to do that. And there is there one a... other woman who's very influential on, on Emerson's wife, his aunt Mary, um, but not in the ways we're, we're discussing. Mary Moody Emerson. She was a force of nature. I believe she has her own biographer. Is there a um, particular work in the book, Tyler, that uh, if people are reading it, you would want them to spend a little extra time on? Um, I would love it if people went, you know, I mentioned Manhattan earlier. And of course, you know, you can't reproduce an avant-garde film in a book even if it was out of copyright, and I think it's still in copyright. Um, but it is on YouTube where something like 13 million people have viewed it, um, or it's been viewed 13 million times. I would love it if people read my six paragraphs on Manhattan and watched Manhattan and had a different experience of Manhattan. Manhattan is just one of the great, awesome artworks about any city in the world. And it's about New York, of course. It's of New York, of course. Um, uh, the, the Watkins we showed earlier, I just swoon over. I mean, I think that's just one of the most amazing, not just images of the American 19th century, but uh, compositions of multiple ideologies uh, in, in, into a single image. Um, uh, I don't know when you spend, you know, I spent an extra year and a half writing this book because of the pandemic. Um, you know, so it kind of sat for a while. Um, and so kind of, there are a lot of pictures in it. I really, I really, really like, um, uh, but yeah, if people, uh, were motivated to Manhattan by the book, that would be pretty neat. There's a question. I I saw, Do you see that question? I saw it come across, but I didn't have time to read it. Um, it says, did Emerson also have the metaphor of nature in terms of change? Um, That's a good, good question. That is a good question. Um, oh, that is a good question. I would have to think more about, I, I mean, I think yes. I mean, because I think he must have written of the passage of the seasons. I think there is this, a pa this is off the top of my head, it's hard to recall 15,000 words um, without having had the opportunity to look. But I, I do think there's, there's a passage in the chapter on beauty about the passage of seasons. Maybe it's in the chapter on idealism. One, one, one of the ways that artists pick up on change and use it in the metaphorical way Emerson advises is all of those, all of those many, many paintings of American autumn, of mm -hmm. American fall turning bright and orange and yellow. And these paintings especially explode after the Civil War. 
So there are two things that I think are happening there. One, our historians have noted for many years, and that is that the old country, Britain, didn't have spectacular orange, yellow, and red autumns like we do. It was a way of saying, yeah, yeah, we've got it. Look what we got. Um, but it's also, you know, autumn is also the season in which nature has reached its full maturity um, before regenerating. Right. Um, and after the Civil War, the American Republican idea, so went the discourse of the 1860s, late 1860s, the American Republican idea, the experiment had survived a test and come through the other end stronger and better. Um, and, and so when you see a painting of autumn from 1866 or 72, or especially 1876, the year of the, the American centennial, um, you should know that's what that painting's about. There's a Jasper Cropsey in the book from the Detroit Institute of Arts, which I think is one of the two or three greatest paintings um, uh, about the end of the Civil War and the reunification of, of the nation. Um, and I write an extended caption about that. Um, Cropsey dipped into the same inkwell. Um, so that's an 1866 painting in Detroit, dipped into the same inkwell for an 1876 painting, an American centennial painting now with the Chrysler in Norfolk. Um, which uses a lot of the same metaphors and uses the classic stand-in metaphorical reference to republicanism, um, a mill, a sawmill on a river. There is a, when you were saying the chapter on idealism, I was trying to remember that and I, I went and looked real quick. Um, that concept of change comes in the, in the form of the change of perspective. Oh, ooh, that's right. Very good. It talks about the hot air balloon perspective oh, shift. Yes. And so, so yeah, so Jeff, to answer your question, yes, change is definitely part Emerson of Emerson has this great passage where he says, um, uh, change your perspective by, or maybe he describes himself as having do it, doing it, as, as, as bending over and sticking your head between your knees and looking out the other side um, uh, and, and see how that changes your, your, your view of the world. And it's a great passage because, of course, to read that is to imagine yourself doing it. And so Emerson is writing this in 1836 and photography is invented or at least photography, the invention of photography is announced in 1839. So at this time, when you, when you wanted to make a picture, you would look into a lens and in, in, in a camera device and you would see the world upside down. Um, and so here's Emerson writing three years before the announcement of the invention of photography, describing exactly what a photographer um, would see. Um, and it sent me down a rabbit hole that got me yelled at by several art historian friends. Um, you know, I, 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 I had the crazy idea and I think it's crazy. It's probably crazy. Um, I'm not embarrassed about it, but I, I think it would, yeah, it's a little crazy. But Emerson was in correspondence with many people in England, uh, many, form, many of in, for, foremost English intellectuals. He had Julia Margaret Cameron photographs hanging in his house, for example. He knew people. So if there were people in England who knew about Talbot's developments or even Daguerre's across the channel um, developments before those developments were made public. Um, if it had been by as much as three years, Emerson was in a better position than almost anybody in America to have known of them. Um, every historian I've raised this with has just laughed at me and they know more about Talbot and Daguerre than I do by miles. So I'm sure they're right to laugh at me, but it is wild to think of the view well, that Emerson describes describe it, kind of exactly as so, being I mean, exactly what you would see in a camera in just a couple of years. I mean, not being a historian of photography, I would say I'm always quick to say with it. Talbot because Talbot was um, being someone who's researched heavily the history of photogravure and Talbot being um, the inventor of flat plate process photogravure that was later evolved by Clink yeah. and became known as the Talbot Clink process. Yeah. Um, Talbot was, had his hand in just about every pot there was. Um, yeah. He was a very wide ranging and reaching man because he was, he was, he was driven. He was really focused. And so he was, he was very well connected and very far reaching um, in order to support his own claims, you know, and for him, a lot of, uh, um, you know, he had a lot of philosophical views about the capture of light um, and what that meant at, in that time, you know, of romantic notions of the capture of light. Um, yeah, and I'm always quick to say that just because I wrote a book about a photographer doesn't mean I'm a scholar of photography. <laughs> um, I mean, my, my, the, the focus of that book was other than 
Watkins in the context of photographic history. So, right. Um, if there are any other questions, go ahead and shout them out. Otherwise, I'd like to thank Tyler for his time and 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 for this perspective because it for me, I think it um, really intrigued me about it as as a way of learning how to read our past in a different way and how that informs the present. And I think that there's a lot of connections that when you go through this material, it makes you really look at what you thought you knew differently. And I think that's how it worked for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you can't unsee it once you see it. I think that's really the big thing about it is that once you start to really start to learn to read it. And I think that goes for, you know, any work of a different culture and we can consider this in some ways as a as a different culture even though we're part of it we're the product of this culture today um is learning is learning how to enter into it and and by learning how to enter into our own past cultural experiences i think it really helps inform ways in which to unpack the present you know so it's i think it's it's this type of work is something we need a lot more of out there this type of scholarly work if anybody would like a signed and personalized copy, I've set up a thing with my local indie bookstore. Um, the book's 25 bucks. It's a total steal. Um, DM, me, DM me on Instagram at Tyler Green Books or DM me on Twitter at Tyler Green Books. Um, and I'll set you up with Malaprops, uh, uh, indie bookstore uh, that's about halfway between where, um, where, <laughs> where Phil and I live, between exactly. each of our homes. It's probably right between um, us, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think I've already signed and shipped like 35 or 40 books through them. Um, uh, so it works real well. And, um, um, and Random House and the folks at Prestel have made a really gorgeous object um, that hopefully reads okay. I mean, at least my, you know, Emerson's parts are definitely read okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> his, his read, <laughs> time tested, I guess. Um, you know, and I, so I just want to say thank you again, Tyler, for your time and, and for the book. And it's one of those things that um, I'm encouraging if you guys are at all interested in it. This is, it's a really, on a lot of levels, it's a really good read and it's really enlightening on a, on a lot of other levels. It's, um, it's more exposing of culpability. And I think wow. that it, it does a really good job of helping you get to that place if you're not already already living in a lot of that space yourself. And so um, I, so I think it's I think it's serving a lot of good in that way. And um, American art was part of the construction of the nation. And I, you know, for me, you know, I sent out some notes to different faculty at universities. You know, I had, I had a long program when I was at the Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop in New York, uh, an internship program with Wellesley and would get uh, an, a Wellesley near graduating art students who come and work. And one of the more common things that each one of these young women would say is, I'm not sure if I can keep doing art because I feel like it's not enough. Like I should be like being a doctor and going saving children in some far flung war torn part of the world or being an attorney fighting for the rights of the disadvantaged and feeling this this intense need to make a positive but significant quote unquote significant contribution and i would always walk them back and and talk about art and its influence throughout time and what it's done and how someone can still see the sistine chapel ceiling and have a moving moment and what that can do for them and and to me, a book like this really highlights the value and the importance of artists within their culture and the role and the responsibility that they have to play. And I think if you read it in that way, in that lens as a young artist, it should hopefully instill you with a sense of honing your voice for a purpose so that the work you make as an artist has purpose in the world because you can clearly see that it can have effect. And so for me in that regard, you know, being someone who's taught lots of young people how to make work and make and how to help hone their own voice, I think it's, it's a good example in that way um, because it's a readable text and it's a relatable text. So I just want to say thanks for putting it out there and hopefully it ends up in the hands of some young people. Yay. Yeah, it's, it's um, as I talk with artists for the Modern Art Notes podcast, um, 
people who've known this artist who've known this book has been coming. We've been talking about it for the last year or two, um, you know, before and after we tape segments. And, um, you know, I think there are segments on the show that maybe people will hear a little differently after having read this book. You know, we, we, we taped a show like most recently with Alison Janae Hamilton, for example. Um, and I think that her work, which I adore, um, can be understood in some ways as an answer to a lot of the histories constructed by Emerson and artists that are presented in this book. And I think she knows that. Right. right. <laughs> I think that's not an accident. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I think for me, it just gives you a, a great lens to look at a lot of work, especially work from the thirties and the forties um, in the United States, which is so foundational to the work that came in the sixties and the seventies Yeah, um, to really look at that work through a different lens and understand even sometimes what some of the artists may not have known they were continuing by picking up on things that they were seeing. And so I like guess for me, it's really good to have, have that uh, resource to be able to, to look back and understand more of what was intended and then what yeah. the results were. So, yeah. Well, thank you again. And I'll uh, just thank a you, last Phil. bit of housekeeping next uh, book club will be in two weeks. November 11th will be with Robin Reisenfeld, um, who is a multifaceted, multi-talented scholar, historian, has spent a lot of time in, all aspects of the art world, but her main area of expertise and love and joys um, are the German expressionists. And we'll be having a conversation about German expressionism and its continued influence on the work of today. So it's not, not just a history lesson, but it's really about showing how that work is still resonating through to today, um, cross-culturally too, not just in the United States. So it should be a pretty engaging conversation. Okay. So thank you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Have a good night. You too. Thanks, Phil. Thanks everybody. Welcome.